Hey, everybody, welcome back to our eighth and final week here on Vox University. Guys, I just want to say first and foremost, it has been such a delight preparing all these like little uh, online lessons and presenting them to this camera. Hopefully that you guys can watch them from home. Um, I love doing this type of stuff. It is a great joy. I love that I'm at a church that empowers me to do this and to speak to all of you. So thank you guys for tuning in and also thank you uh, to the church and to our staff and to Rustin for giving me the space to be able to do this. And so thank you guys so much. Also a huge thanks to Pip all the way over there for running every single uh, week's tech. So even if I was doing this, it would be completely pointless for me to do it because I'd be talking to an empty room and to a camera that wouldn't be turned on and then no one would be able to see it. But because of Pip, he turns on the camera and puts lights up and soundboards and all these great things. So thank you for Pip for running all the uh, tech for us. So thank you guys for watching. Thank you for everyone who's enabling me to do this type of stuff. Uh, but yeah, let, let's begin. If you are tuning in, this is the eighth and final week of Vox University. This is a pre-recording, so if you try to put a comment in the comment section, we won't be able to see them in the live text bubble because obviously we are not live, but please put any comments down below. Uh, even though we don't have another week coming up, that way I can weave those questions into the lesson for next week. We'd love to see who all has been listening and all those good things, so put your comments down below in the comment section. But this is the last week, so I thought the best way to go about this was to kind of recap a little bit of everything that we've been doing. It's been seven Seven weeks, that's like two months, maybe even longer. It's been, it's been a while. It's been a great time. But wanted to kind of recap with one word what we've been doing. But more importantly, provide you guys with some realistic next steps. Um, some homework, if we continue with this university theme, if you will. What are things that you guys can be doing to implement some of the things that we've talked about? Perhaps some of the lessons you've learned or things that have at the very least made you think as we've been walking through these seven weeks of Vox University. So, I have them all on the board here. We're going to walk through them one at a time, and I'm going to provide you guys uh, with each week. If you like watch the week and you're like, man, that's the week I really like. I wish you had talked more about that. Or like, what am I supposed to do with this information? Well, hopefully this week will give you guys some guidance into the rest of your weeks, into what to do with some of these questions or knowledge, or perhaps gain even more wisdom. So let's begin. The very first week, oh my gosh, that was so long ago. If you remember, and I'm pretty sure I put these all in the right order. Uh, someone might correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we might have to do a little bit, bit of uh, switcheroos, if you will, but we'll be all right. Uh, the first week, we talked about the importance of being open to new sources. We talked about Moses, and we talked about how there are certain words that we use, even like Moses' name or the word slavery, that spark images in our mind. And as soon as they spark, we have to make sure that what we are thinking, that instant reaction train of thought, is actually correct. And we use both his name, but also the word slavery itself to show that we have a jaded view of what slavery was, and therefore, when we read it in the Bible, we present our views of it and not the biblical interpretation. And so we talked about the importance of being open to new sources and the importance of being open to things that we may not normally understand, because I talked about how it wasn't until I got involved and was reading in college and was reading Jewish sources that I understood Christian sources better. Um, and so if you thought, man, I would love to do that, but I don't know where to start. Well, I've got a great recommendation for you. Um, this recommendation um, is going to be to read. Let's put the word up there before I show you, before I, before I uh, get ahead of myself. But if you would like to be open to new sources, the best new sources to start reading is to read new sources. And so I would love to recommend to you this book, um, it is called Jacob and the Prodigal. Can we see that all in focus over there, Pip? Perfect. Um, Jacob and the Prodigal. This is by Kenneth Bailey. I'm going to put that name up there, make sure I spell it right, um, because I would love for you guys to read, but more importantly, read good sources. And Ken Bailey, I'm going to try to make sure that I spell his name right. Yep. Um, I've written it enough you would hope that I would. Um, uh, Ken Bailey is someone that I've drawn a lot of inspiration from. He is huge into understanding the history and the context, and more than just like reading a book that presents that context, he will read the Christian narrative in the Gospels or in the biblical text, and then he'll read the Jewish sources, and then he'll take the two and put them into a teaching package in his series. Um, so Jacob and the Prodigal is a great book, uh, kind of tying some of the Old Testament themes into the life of Christ, and how sometimes in the Christian church we, we put dots together that shouldn't be there, but then oftentimes we miss the glaring dots that we should be connecting. So if you are interested in this historical approach and being open to new sources, cannot recommend uh, Kenneth Bailey, Ken Bailey enough. So please go out, check out that book, Jacob and the Prodigal. It's like 
200 some odd pages. I think it's $15 on Amazon. Um, but he also has a whole bunch of other books. Um, if you like that one, a great next step would be Jesus Through uh, Middle Eastern Eyes or Paul Through Mediterranean Eyes, where he really dives into almost like an autobiographical look of uh, Paul and Jesus, I'm sorry, biographical look of Paul and Jesus and like what they really would have looked like. So if you want to be open to new sources, good new sources involving the history of the biblical narrative, uh, reading Kenneth Bailey, but also reading in general, making sure that you have good sources to read from will help you paint the biblical pictures with color. Um, So let's continue. The next one we talked about was words and the importance of the words that we use and how they build worlds. It's also where we began to plant those seeds, if you will, that we're all theologians. And if we're all theologians, we need to be careful about the words that we're using because we may not always understand each other just because we're using the same language. And so the word that we talked about specifically was image of God. And even though it sounds like something very simple, there's actually a lot more than just one concrete meaning that we might have been taught from birth. And so if if you're interested in understanding better words and using words better, um, I have a really great, uh, some homework assignment for you, and that is to read. Uh, nothing will help you use words better than, than reading words better. You know what I'm saying? Um, but once again, reading this might sound kind of like a cop-out because I used it before, but I've got a specific author for you this time. Um, just like with Ken Bailey, if you're wanting to read some of that um, historical text, I cannot recommend uh, Henry Nowen enough. I, I just grabbed one of my many books off my bookshelf upstairs. This is The Wounded Healer. If you're like, man, Levi, that 200-some page book, uh, that looks a little bit thick. Good news, this is like... I think a hundred pages flat, if that, a uh, hundred and two pages. And, and even, not only that, but the pages are nice and small. Look at that. Nice and small pages. We love to see it. Um, but Henry Nowen is a great person to read to help understand theology better. He has everything from devotionals. This is about understanding Jesus and his wounds that he had during his ministry and how we ourselves can lead through our wounds. So reading Henry Nowen is a great place to help us understand our theology. I'm going to put that name up there. This book is also on Amazon. If you bought it off the shelf, it's only $12, which means on Amazon it's probably six cents. Uh, there we go. Henry Nowen. I would have never known how to spell that word if I didn't read it because all those vowels are not where they're supposed to be. Um, but reading Henry Nowen is a great way, like I talked about, to, to begin to understand theology better. It's smaller books. It'll take time. They look small, but they are dense uh, intellectually. So working through reading a chapter in the morning or whenever you prefer to read or whatever is a great way to help you understand the words that you use and the weight that they might be bringing with them. Um, so that's what we've got. Trust me, this is the only time I'm using read. I'm not going to do read for every single category. Um, some of you might have been like, I know where this is going. We're all, all we're going to have to do is read and read and read. Um, saved read for the first two. I could have done it all the way down, but let's, let's continue. Let's look at some more next steps. Um, if you loved that logic series, we had a lot of people responding to that. I had a lot of great feedback. I thank you guys for everyone who says that. People will tell me that this is great, uh, helps give me direction and thoughts on where to go next. Um, But we did a two-part series, so if you're like, man, I'm going to have eight homework assignments, good news, because it's two-part, it's technically one homework assignment, so you're already down to seven if you're wanting to do all of these. Um, But but the best thing to do with logic, if you've watched that, um, is is to identify. So I'm just going to put ID. Um, you, you identify logic in your life. And so what I'm going to encourage you guys to do, if you've watched that or even to re-watch it to get it fresh in your mind, um, is to literally like get a sheet of paper and write an area of your life. And now I encourage you guys, get as specific as you can. Like you might put like everyday life. And and that'd be great because the broader you are, uh, the easier it might be to kind of like finagle your way around real growth. But the more specific you are, you can really zone into one area of your life. Um, So for me, like I put my expectations from God. Um, And then what I did, do a little underline, and then do uh, that one, two, three, four, five all the way down and write out those five logical fallacies or even draw the pictures. Like the very first one, if you remember, um, uh, was the false dilemma. We talked about it's either this or this. And so when I think about my expectations with God, where am I using these logical fallacies that's putting a barrier between understanding God for who he truly is? And so like, for example, like with the, uh, with the uh, 
not logical fallacy, with, with the false dilemma, with the false dilemma. I use that with God, um, and I realized I use it when I pray for things. Um, because I immediately say, well, God will either give it to me or he will not give it to me. And, and that's a false dilemma. I am removing the ability to understand God as complex. I'm removing the ability um, to say maybe God has it for me in a way that I'm not expecting expecting it. I, I say, God, I want this, and more importantly, I want it this way, and either you will give it to me or you will not give it to me. And I'm using a false dilemma, a, a logical fallacy with my expectations, with my relationship with God. And so going through and labeling down, where have I used these, and it's causing a barrier? It might be like with your children. Um, I, I told my kid, clean, my, clean their room, and they didn't do it, therefore they do not respect me as a parent. Well, well let, let's, let's pull back. Let, let's slow down. Let's, let's not dive into that harsh, false dilemma line. And so going through, it's a great thing to do like with, with a spouse, uh, with, with other relationships, relationship with God, even like relationship with your church, thinking like, man, what are the logical fallacies that I bring in with my expectations with the church? And what am I expecting the church to do? Or the people on staff or, or my own family or my spouse or my my friends, or, or anything. It's a great way to help you identify where you are at fault with these logical fallacies. And, I, and I'm going to be honest, it, it's very difficult work. Um, don't expect to get it done in five minutes. If you sit down and just like bop, 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 I'm done. Um, let, let, slow down, think more critically, the, dive deeper in, but also begin to ask why. Why do I think that when this happens, it must be because of this. Why do I turn my arguments with someone into a scarecrow argument? And digging deeper and not just being satisfied with throwing answers on the wall, but actually digging into why were those the answers that you were able to reaction, think of, to throw in the first place. So, so that's the challenge with that one. See how that one wasn't read? That, that's some self-reflective work. Um, uh, but, but always being able to identify where those fallacies are in your life is where we can begin to correct them. Because like we talked about, how, how our heart is is how we think, and how we think is how we speak and act. And so if we can change how we think, then we can identify what's really going on in our heart. And then that will change how we speak and act with one another. Um, the next one we talked about was prayer. Oh man, good times. Um, uh, with prayer, we talked about the reasons for prayer and why we pray. Uh, why we pray, that's words, trust me. Um, and so my, my, my homework with prayer is, is going to be this one. And uh, I'm trying to stick to like one word for each of these homeworks, since I used one word uh, for each thing. But, but to spend more time, just set aside more time. Whatever you're used to praying uh, lengthwise, set aside more. If you don't have, like, I tried to pay, pray five minutes. Well, well, challenge yourself. Think, well, you know, okay, so I, I pray before I go to bed. That's probably two or three minutes, realistically 20 seconds. Um, so I'm going to set a timer. I'm going to do something to intentionally lengthen the amount of time I spend in prayer. But we talked about these three categories of why we pray and the things that we pray for in those prayers. And so actually going through and making sure that we're spending time uh, praying to God and thanking God and asking for God's forgiveness and interceding on others' behalf and checking our and calling ourselves to better action and uh, reviewing the things that we are doing, not just praying for guidance in the future, but praying for guidance in the here and now. Am I doing enough? Am I aware enough? Are the things that God once told me to do, are they still the things I'm supposed to do, or did I think that right turn was just right turns forever? Um, and so praying for guidance in the future, for the now, for things in the past, that's, that's what prayer is. It's spending extra time with the Lord. It's how we build that relationship. So with prayer, I encourage you all, uh, what next? Spend more time and pray more intentionally. Pray for all those categories for the here, now, and past. Um, our next category was sin. That was like everybody's favorite, right? Like we love talking about sin. It makes me feel great inside. I get warm and fuzzy thinking about all the horrible things I've ever done. Um, but with sin, um, it, it's difficult to talk about because even like talking about it right now, like I get a little bit apprehensive and I'm like, okay, what can I say to soothe myself and, myself and others? Um, but with sin, I'm trying to think about the best one word uh, to, to really think about it. Um, and, and that is uh, to really spend some time with grace. Um, what, what I would encourage you to do is similar 
uh, to what you did with logic. And, and spend some time, whether it's, it's journaling. I, I'm not a huge journaler. I wish I was. I've tried so many times. I've got like the coolest Lord of the Rings journals in the whole world. And I'll be really excited to look at them. And then I don't really care about opening them. It, it's something I wish I was better at. But whenever I am able to get into the habit of doing it better, I, I find great joy in it. Or for me, what I end up doing for journaling, because in case you can't tell, I talk a lot, is whenever I'm driving by myself, I talk like as, I'm, as if I'm talking to this camera right now. And I just talk and talk and talk, and I externally process uh, with myself and with the Lord. And so whatever your version of that is, I'm going to encourage you, um, spend some time reflecting on yourself and on your own sins. But more importantly, um, to put those sins in that categories like we talked about and understand that, that grace is enough for you. Grace is sufficient. Grace will cover. We identify those sins. That way we can help move past those sins. That way we can ask for forgiveness for those sins. And that way we can try to overcome them. And so what I'm going to ask for everyone is, is grace. Le learn to give yourself grace by learning how sinful we really are. Right? That sounds like a little bit of a paradox, but, but we really try to like lead with our best foot and put our best foot forward and, and put up this facade that will hide our sin even from ourselves. Right? Like, like we are really good at, at justifying away the wrong we do. But if we're able to stop justifying it away and embrace sin for sin as that thing that separates us from God for the in, uh, intentional purpose of covering it with grace, that's when we can really begin to move past sin. And, and whatever that looks like for you, whether that's reaching out to a friend uh, for accountability, accountability has changed my life. If you do not have an accountability partner, find yourself an accountability partner because they will help you with your grace. When you feel bad on yourself, get someone who will remind you that grace is enough. Um, so so that's, that's my homework with sin. That was a little bit more vague, uh, but that's intentional because I can't tell everyone exactly how to work with each one of these issues. Reading's really easy. That's why I kind of wanted to put read down the list. Um, but, but let's get more specific. Um, with, with week seven here, as we were coming to a close, um, we talked about perfection. Uh, and this is very similar to talking about sin. Um, but with perfection, we talked about the purpose of... Um, but knowing about perfection and realizing that we are not is for forgiveness. But more importantly, uh, let's zone in a little bit further and talk about forgive. Um, and, and forgiving ourselves and forgiving others is something that we are called to as Christians. And so the purpose of understanding perfection, like we talked about, is to understand that you are not perfect. And therefore, the, the forgiveness that you need from God is the forgiveness that you need to extend to others as well. And, and so spend some time reminding yourself, I'm not perfect. In fact, if you really wanted to sit down with a list and list out all the ways you're not perfect and feel really bad about yourself and then feel caught up in the sin cycle, then you can remember that grace is enough to cancel out that sin cycle. And even though you're not perfect, you are forgiven. It's a great way to kind of break that little cycle right there. Um, but do that. Like in all seriousness, like, like we, we do such a good job at avoiding feeling bad. We will do anything to avoid feeling bad. But if you can embrace knowing that this is something that you should feel bad about, but then that God steps in into that narrative, uh, that's when transformation and life change can happen. Uh, and so finally, uh, we have this up next, um, and, and this is, this is pretty, pretty simple. Uh, I'm going to do two. You guys ready, ready for this? Two, two things that you guys can do. Um, the first one's going to be a really easy, you might be like, that's even worse than your read. Uh, why are you doing that? Uh, the first is going to be church. Right, Church is great. I love church. I, I'm, I'm going to be super biased. I've always loved the church, but I love Vox. I love being here. I love being on staff. If I wasn't on staff here, I'd just be here in general. Like I love this community. There's something special about it, uh, and I'm so blessed to be able to work at a place like this. Um, but, but church is so important, and so if you're like, man, these are all great, remember that part of what Jesus set up and Paul calls us to is the church. Well, the church is where we live these practices out. The church is where we can do all these uh, and be reminded of all these, but more importantly, not just be limited to eight. Instead, we get to come every week to be challenged, to be heard, to be prayed for, to be reminded of the presence of God. And so being a part of church, if you've been watching this, and if you're like me, you might have already kind of like begin to like be like, man, it's really easy to not go to church on Sundays. 
Ever since I haven't had to go to church on Sunday because I legally and responsibly can't go to church on Sunday, um, it, it's pretty great sleeping in. I kind of get what all these people are vibing with. This is great. I get to do my own thing on Sunday. Um, but challenge that. Eventually, this time will pass, and the church doors will be open again. And when that happens, don't settle for the online. If you can responsibly come to church, it being in the community of believers is something that revives ourselves and revives our souls. Um, so the importance of church, right? Uh, and then number two, um, uh, I, I told you we, we'd have two of these because we kind of got the combine right up there, um, is if you did not uh, check out all these. Wow, that I, you Brax, probably can't even read that. Uh, that's horrible. But, but rewatch one of these. If you are thinking, man, man, this was really great. This was transformative. I really enjoyed one of these lessons. I really, this provoked me to think better, but I missed uh, part two of this logic thing. Go back and rewatch it or, or watch it for the first time. Or, or like wh whenever you think, man, I, I, I wish I could remember what that lesson was. Come, that, that's the glory of it all being on YouTube, right? Um, you can come back and rewatch it. But more than just rewatching this, um, every Sunday we have a huge library of Rustin's messages in podcast form. If you are kind of missing this church, if you um, are, are missing more of Rustin's deep teaching, I know that I have been, being able to go back and rewatch or re listen to podcasts of sermons that I know I've heard before that have helped me has been just life changing, has been great, especially for someone who road trips a lot. It's been awesome. Um, my, or if you're like me and you haven't been at church as long as Rustin has been, um, there's a whole bunch of things that he said before I even knew Vox was a church. And so I can go back and listen to things and words of wisdom that people at our church have said that I was not here to hear. Um, and so knowing that there is a library of information, just a massive online encyclopedia where we can do this better, um, it, it's, it's great. It's wonderful. So, so that's my challenge for you. Hopefully all of you guys have some steps in mind that you can take moving forward now that Vox University is officially coming to a close. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to pray for all of you who are watching, whether it's this Thursday or any time in the future, um, uh, as you're re-watching, whatever it is, I want to pray a little prayer of blessing for all of us, and then this will conclude our Vox University teaching series. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time, Lord. Thank you for, for time that you have given us, but also for time that you are allowing us uh, to move past through online recording, Lord. Thank you that this will be available for people uh, for years to come, Lord. I pray that everyone who watched this will be able to learn and grow closer to you because of this, Lord. We thank you uh, for these tools that we are being able to use as a church and to grow as a church to help impact our ministry in ways that we didn't think was possible, Lord. God, I thank you for all these people who have watched Lord, I pray a blessing for them. Let these words just live in their hearts, Lord. Help them to grow and move, but Lord, more importantly, help them to not be satisfied with these eight weeks, Lord. Lord, I pray that they will find things to do, this, this homework that I might have said, or even better, something that they were thinking about doing and have the courage to take those next steps uh, and to follow you in faithfulness, Lord. We pray for all these things, God. Thank you for this church. Thank you for what you're doing in our community through Vox, Lord. Thank you for the staff and all the people who attend, Lord. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in, and I will not see you next week, but I hope to see you in the future here at Vox.